Rana, the faction closely aligned with swamp dwellers and namely dragons. A difficult faction to understand, but one when mastered can bring destruction to your enemies. In this faction guide video, I want to help you out on discussing the many aspects of each of the factions within the game. We'll start out by going over a general faction overview, units, wielders, and then close the video out by talking about spells and skills, as well as building priority. Just to reiterate, Songs of Conquest is very much about playing the game that you want, not trying to maximize every single little move. There are a lot of different ways to approach the game, going wider with a larger army, or perhaps taller with a more elite army. So while this guide is meant to give you a sense of better understanding of Rana, I truly encourage you to find a playstyle that really fits with what you like or look for in a game. Min-maxing the game isn't going to net you that much more of a benefit to to uh, compared to immersing yourself in a style that is all your own. With that, you can navigate to each of these sections outlined above using the chapters in both the timeline and the description. And if you end up enjoying the video, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I'll be covering Sounds of Conquest with tons of guides, streams, and other fun videos in the future. Let's get started here on our faction guide for the Rana. So to open up with a faction overview, I want to talk about the Rana as a whole. And they're a very interesting faction. Um, I almost want to think of them as the primary spellcaster faction, but that's that's kind of really not the truth. Every single faction can be a really good spellcaster and focus on the spells that your specific faction's units generate. But I feel like they have so many ways to either negate magic or buff magic or buff their individual units, and it's needed because Rana's units are very interesting too. Most factions, of well, all the factions, of course, can upgrade their units. And sometimes you get a little bit of a bump, but with Rana, you get a whole different style of unit. Even their very first unit goes from being a really terrible frontline unit to a really strong stalwart one. And that's kind of something that you should really keep in mind with Rana. You're dealing with a faction that is very slow on the move with a good chunk of its units, but units that can be buffed and really enhanced a lot of different ways with a lot of overlapping synergies. I think of all the armies, Rana takes the most understanding, the most kind of play testing to smash your head against the rock, more or less. You, you have to really play this faction a ton to really get a good idea for how these units are going to play with your specific play style and with their overlapping kind of benefits. This extends into the wielders too. Rana is really a faction where you have to rely on the strengths and you have to really shore up those weaknesses. I feel like with Loth or Bari or Arleon, there's enough leeway where you can get away with certain units being good on their own or certain wielders being great above the rest, whatever it is. So I just want to kind of let that be known ahead of time that with Rana, this this might be a little more difficult, but I still think it's going to be a hugely rewarding faction for you. Now, the units for uh, Rana are, are very interesting. Very interesting because they're going to be pretty wild here. So let's start with our first one with the Hunters. And with the Hunters, take a look at this profile. It's terrible. <laughs> six health, six offense, two defense, but you get four movement and a great initiative of 30. That's where the, you're really going to thrive with the Hunters is getting across the field doing damage. And... I think that most of the factions, I, I, in fact, I think the other three factions as a whole, you can get away with one of each unit type, but I think with Rana, you really need to worry about, or not worry about, really need to stack units. I think having two groups of hunters is a really strong play because this allows you to get a lot of mobility and a lot of damage with this full stack of 50 that is easily accessible in your game. Because once you upgrade these to the Storm Guards, that's when you get a really good unit. The health doubles, the melee offense I think more than doubles, yeah, it almost triples, it more than triples. <laughs> it goes up quite a bit here, um, all the way up to 16, um, and melee defense goes from two to 13. That's huge. So you get it, you get it what I'm saying here, that the, the upgrades that you're going to notice on these units is going to be huge. When you make that jump to the new unit, you're going to get a lot of value out of it. Because looking at the Storm Guard, we get Stealthy. This is something that the Hunters have. Oh, I'm sorry. No, they don't. But you get Stealthy and you also get Ability Defend. Increases their defense by 30. So remember, it's an ability. So it will cost you a movement and it will end your turn. But... You can move three spaces and then use the ability to defend. So this is a really cool way to throw the storm guard out in the front, 
use defend, and now you have a unit with 33 defense that the AI or usually your enemy will probably want to get up close and personal with. In addition to that, you have stealthy. So on your next high initiative turn, you can move the storm guards out of harm's way if you so wish. But this is what I'm trying to say with, you're going to need to focus on a lot of these upgrades for these units because that's where they really start to shine. And speaking of, let's talk about the shaman here. So the shaman is not a ton of damage on the on the on the table here. One two damage, um, very uh, ranged offense of seven, a range of five, a deadly range of three, and he has venomous. Now to reiterate for those who don't know, venomous is a poison, and the poison will do damage based off of your wielder's level. Since I don't have a wielder in this camp, it's just going to say one. But if my wielder was level fifteen, it would be fifteen damage every time that unit that is poisoned activates. So. This is another instance where stacking units can really help out. If I had four slots, stacking two units of hunters and two units of shamans is a really good early army. Why? Because poison stacks. So if my guy is level, my wielder is level four and two shamans attack one target, it'll do eight damage. The next turn, if I do the same thing, 16 damage. So this is a way you can stack a lot of these things, get these benefits to kind of wrap around each other because it's going to be crucial for you. Moving into the next one, the Sage, we get Inspiring. So give friendly units within one hex, one melee offense, five range offense, and five initiative. Again, you get that um, Venomous. So this is another example <clears throat> where putting these guys in two separate stacks, they're going to buff each other. So if I had 30 Shamans that I upgraded into Sages, putting them into two groups of 15 is going to be pretty damn advantageous because your range is increasing here by, six, by one from six... Sorry, from five to six, deadly range, of course, goes up by one as well here. But that inspiration is going to trip off on one another if you keep them in close range. So this is like I was saying is Rana relies on a lot of synergistic use of overlapping benefits on top of one another. And that even becomes more prevalent when we talk about the guardian or guards. Sorry, the guards here. The guards are slow. Their movement is two. And these other ones, I mean, this one's got to move in a three, this one's got to move in a four, so at least they're going to be moving down range if they need to. Uh, but the guard here is not going to be moving. Really, what he's going to be doing is guarding, and that's the primary purpose of this unit. You place it next to some range units, and now they get plus 10 defense. What's, what's kind of the misnomer with a lot of the factions is, you know, just charge down, meet up with the enemy, and kill them. Rana is kind of about baiting them towards you. That's why you've got the storm guard who has stealthy and defend. You bait them closer to you. You pull out of the engagement. You pull them back to your units. Maybe you pull them right next to a guard who can help out with the defense. Or progress it up to the protector who now gives 25 defense. And he also gives 10 defense. So he has an ability called protect. Give friendly units within one hex. 25 defense or just his innate passive of 10 so he can sit there and just shore up everyone's defense by 35 stop him next to a storm guard well that's a whole ton more defense so this is what i mean where again stack these things together have the protectors next to your range units have your protectors running toe to toe with your storm guards to kind of overlap their defensive bonuses it's how you have to play rana because you're moving so slow you're going to be outpaced by your storm guards. So you're going to get killed in the front line. All the enemies are going to ignore the protectors because they're so slow they can't get next to them. Then they're going to kill your ranged and all that's left is to surround and kill your protectors. This is why you have to keep things together and keep them cohesive in the Rana army. Moving then into our Ravagers, we get a the, the fastest unit on the board here with a base 5 movement and the Charger special rule. So for each step, if it makes the full 5, it'll get plus 50 melee offense on top of its innate 19. So this is really your, your shock troop. It does a good bit of damage. And you can then upgrade it to the Rider of the Swamp. What's cool about this upgrade too, is if you look at the status, it says Rana and Beast. So it will take the advantages of researches of Rana or Beast or whatever you so wish. So keep that in mind. Those things are important because when you want to go do any kind of researches or specializations that help out one over the other, this will take advantage of that. <clears throat> so in addition here to getting a much better profile, right? We go from uh, 30 health to 40 health, 19 to 27, and 13 to 21 defense. And 
Our initiative is still really, really crispy at 31, and we now get the ability to wait. This is huge if we're talking about that mentality of trying to pull your enemy into you. Wait with the Riders of the Swamp, who probably will be going first, if unless you're against like Baria, who has additional 31 some odd initiative units. You have the Rider of the Swamp wait, pull the units in, use the Rider of the Swamp, then with a clear, concise charge. You're not wasting the five movement to push yourself into the middle of the field where you're then focused down or charged in tow by an Arleon Knight and killed. So use that weight to bait out a movement to then get an opportunistic charge in. Moving here into the Crawlers, we get an interesting unit that I, I struggle with. I don't like it as much. Um, it has a good chunk of health. It has great defense and offense though, 21 and 26, but its movement is again really slow. You're stacking this thing with other things that are moving around its kind of speed to try and get this intimidation on. Intimidating is gonna reduce defense and initiative. But if you upgrade the crawler though, we get the ability to wait, which is crucial. Um, this is a, a huge thing. Baria gets weight and uh, Rana gets weight. And those two things really kind of help to shore up the fact that I guess if you're comparing this, Arleon gets a ton of defense, and it's late stage in its heavy offense. Loth gets a lot of offense and really doesn't get as much defense. You have to shore that up. Baria and Rana have so much specialized units that they need this weight capability to help them control the battlefield or their engagements in the battlefield. And the adult crawlers here have a really good stat line of offense and defense and health, but they move very slow. So getting these things in place is really going to be down to crucially using that ability of weight. Again, I don't really like this unit the most. I think I think personally, I don't like the the crawlers. I wouldn't make that upgrade if I was if I had to decide. I, I just would rather just jump to this next unit, which I like far more and get more utility out of. It is the tremor. So the tremor does not upgrade. It is a musician and it gives the dragon's roar ability. So across the map, it will reduce everyone's defense and initiative. So basically, they get the ability to intimidate everyone across the map pretty easily. You do have to keep in mind though that, that their defense is pretty low at 15 and the enemy will focus them down. And it does suck that their initiative is at 17, meaning the majority of the enemy's units will have moved for you then to use dragon's roar which will be active until the tremor goes again which is good but in that first round of combat it's something to be mindful of and it's something that you can get the benefit of by using weight on these guys having these guys hang back to buff these up while they bomb from deep and these guys bait out the charge because this way you've got the dragon's roar reducing initiative reducing defense for the next round and you're not taking as much damage uh, and i also just like this unit more so than the adult crawler um, you get a very similar style of debuff on it and utility. I just kind of overall like the Tremor more. This thing has more stability, you know, higher health, higher defense. So keep those things in mind when you're trying to decide between the two. The next up is the Chelan. Probably my favorite unit here because of the utility of its upgrade. So the default Chelan has 50% range resistance. It's got 50 health, 29 defense, 19 melee offense. It is, it is a veritable tank but its movement is two and initiative is seven. It's going last, it's going dead ass last, but, and it's gonna move real damn slow doing so. So you need to kind of buff this thing as best you can, but really it's not about the damage that it does. It's about this upgrade right here. The Chelan Elder has the ability to charge Essence. So remember, abilities will cost one movement and end the turn. So you can move it one step <laughs> and then buff your ability, or use your ability charge essence. Now what this does is, look at the essence that the Chelan Elder generates. Two creation and one arcana. This sends it into your pool when you activate the Chelan Elder, and then when you charge essence, you'll get another blast of that. So this enables you to really boost your creation. Really, really boost your creation. And I really love that because Creation opens the door to some really strong abilities, and we'll take a look at those when we get into the spell section here. So this is what I mean by having a battery that effectively charges your essence. Loth has this too, right? The necromancer can charge your essence. And using that enables you to get a lot of spells off and do a ton of damage. And there's one wielder that we'll talk about too that can really take advantage of the Chelan Elder. Moving into our last, you know, the top tier, we have the F-Draw. And it's an interesting one because... 
It's a range unit with a good amount of ranged offense, and it shoots a fireball, and the fireball will, you know, crisp things up. It has a max troop size of 10, and it has ability ambush, which is actually really cool if you move this thing into a certain situation or a certain location, because it has a movement range of five. And its health is 50 and defense is 20. So it's not it's not some weak range unit. It can actually take a little bit of a punishing. And if you move it in range of something and trigger, or move it kind of midfield or, or, or uh, one quarter in and put ambush, anything that moves within its deadly range, that three step radius, they'll immediately fire at. Well, the first enemy at least. So they'll double their damage, which is really, really, really good actually. So the F draw is really great. But what makes the F draw even better is that it can be upgraded to a dragon. And that is a spicy little mushroom. What? What the hell? Why did I say that? Well, I'm sticking with it. So the dragon here is amazing. Of course, it's amazing. It's a dragon. And it's got a huge damage profile, 3550. It's got 140 health, 72 offense, 54 defense, 6 movement, 31 initiative, 5 range. So this bad boy can actually get up close and personal and crisp things up because it has a reach of plus one melee range and its flame attacks will do damage behind targets and it's intimidating and it's inspiring and it can wait. So if you really want to wait it out, you can have this guy go absolutely last and then wait until the enemy stacks up inappropriately for themselves and get roasted by the plus one reach flame attack and also reduce their... their um, their defense if you want to put him right next to something so the dragon is awesome it is absolutely awesome and the best part about it is let's go here I think if i do well i know a unit i've got a, i've got a unit that's got one we jump to him we can see the elder dragons so you're not going to get any different abilities, but your your damage is going to go up. Remember it was 35 to 50 damage? Well, this is 50 to 75. 140, 150 some odd health. This is 200. Melee offense is through the roof. Defense, through the roof. Like, this is such a beast of a character. Now, the, the, the caveat here, it is very hard to get to Elder Dragons as far as the upgrade requirement. It's something like 30... Um, 30 Glimmer Weave, 40 Ancient Amber, 30 Celestial Ore. So you are less likely to actually be able to upgrade to them, but the fact that you can upgrade to an Elder Dragon is just absolutely crispy, and I love it to bits. But those are your units here for Rana. Remember, you're going to be relying a lot on using these units together to try and create a positive synergy or, or way to actually get everyone to kind of work together. Um, my preferences are in the very beginning, I focus on getting some hunters and some shamans out. I would skip the guards and crawlers, focusing on the riders of the swamp and the tremors, and then trying to get to challenge as well, depending upon what wielder and what I'm focusing on. If I'm going heavy into magic, I want those challenges first and foremost. If I'm not, I want those shock troops and that debuffer to really help me out, and then culminate eventually with some dragons, however you so wish. That's my kind of general unit breakdown. As far as research goes, I focus on the Dragon Pyramid because it enables me to increase the durability of my troops. But I will tell you the birthing pools are very, very advantageous. And the only reason I went with the Dragon Pyramid over the birthing pools is because the Dragon Pyramid is required to make the, the Elder Dragons. So that's why I did it. Otherwise, though, I think the birthing pools make a lot of sense for Rana just to get higher cap on even just a storm guard if i just increase my storm guard this building alone would be absolutely worth it but to get a much bigger shaman unit or sage unit would be amazing too and getting more units in my uh, uh riders of the swamp is really really good too so I, I find a lot of advantage here because rana is a faction that i find having multiple stacks of something in my army to be way more advantageous than it is in the other three factions and that again is just personal opinion and the way that i play this faction Next up, we have a conversation about some wielders. Now, there are some good ones and some bad ones. And I think that this is going to come down to the way you want to play and the units you want to specialize in. Because Cheekum Stormcaller here is a great wielder if you want to go hard in the paint on Hunters and Storm Guards. He increases their damage and they're really great. And they also get combat training, right? Combat training is going to increase that damage as well. And I think that 
Going with Cheekum is a really good one because it makes your early game very good, and Hunters are viable all the way throughout your entire playthrough with Rana. Also, you get a 13 movement, so he's a very good option. Ichamo is an individual who's going to be increasing destruction magic. And if you want to go heavy and harden the paint on, on magic, which I think is very advantageous for um, Rana, Ichamo is a good call, but really not the best one. He does specialize in destruction. That is great, but I think there's going to be a better one you're going to like way more than this character, and we'll jump to him in just a little bit. And by just a little bit, I mean right now. Masugna, who sees beyond, is the master of magic because he gets skill creation, which, in my opinion, for Rana, is the best one because you get so much creation um, essence. And having him start with this already is great. And on top of it, look at that, man. 40% spell damage power. Then if you put the actual spell skill, you can get, I think it's channeling is the name of it. Channeling. That's going to be doing so much damage. You could just get level 2 and you'd already be doing 100% spell damage power. You get level 3, you're at 140% spell damage power. So if you want to be the casting master, Musugna is definitely going to be the one for you. Um, also has great defense at 10. I, I do really like that. Most caster wielders have 5 or 0 defense, so it's nice to see that. Pacha here is a heavy defensive character that can completely negate magic. Like, his magic resistance skill and then 40% spell damage resistance. So let's take a look at that one as well. So this was going to give a 75% at max level, plus his 40, that's 105%. So assuming there's no debuffs on the board, you are really going to be just shutting down spell damage left and right. I think this depends upon what you're going to be playing against um, and what you're going to be trying to ward off if you're trying to deal with magic. Pacha is the guy for you because he also starts with Chelens, which is really nice. A nice, really tanky unit that can kind of hang back with the Shamans. Arlac is one of, I, honestly, I think it's my favorite wielder here. He has 11 Hunters and 4 Guards to start off. Um, you can get access to Shamans very quickly from there. And you've got a nice three-person army because the Guards can help the Shamans out. The Hunters can go and die because that's what they do in the beginning and it gives him 15 offense zero defense here though so keep that in mind but he gets combat training and then 20 melee offense and ranged offense like that is really nice looking at combat training again that's increasing your damage here so i really like him he's my favorite one it looks really cool too uh rask is probably one of the fastest wielders i think I think in the game, but his movement's 14. I think there's one other wheel that's 14 movement, but he is extremely fast and he does bonuses to your Ravagers and Riders of the Swamp, even starting with two Riders of the Swamp, which is the upgraded Ravager. That's a really nice start. Um, he also starts with some Hunters. At the beginning of the game though, that might not be 100% the best. It is nice because you can move around really quick, but I think this guy is the ultimate second wielder because once you've already kind of set up the board you've kind of gotten everything around yourself you've upgraded to tier three i think it is and once you get a second wielder pop this guy out and he'll be able to snatch up all of the uh uh the places of power that have ex uh, experience and he'll he'll skyrocket in level and he'll be extremely viable because he'll already be tapping into the riders of the swamp and increasing their damage i'm sorry their their troop movement um by one and using that melee skill to further increase their offense there. Moving down here into Rick Tap, we get a guy who's got some range resistance and guard, which is furthering that range resistance. Um, Rick Tap and Pacha are your two really defensive characters, if you haven't kind of picked up on that. He gives guards and hunters with 15 defense. So if you do want a really safe uh, character that you really want to maybe just have hanging out in one of your, uh, one of your, um, not locations in one of in, in your primary settlement rick tap is perfect because he's just going to be able to hold that line absolutely slakin here is the one that i initially went with and i was kind of lured in by the learning and the range increase on his f draw and if you can keep his f draw all the way to the point in which you unlock dragons that's two free dragons basically you just have to pay the upgrade cost so there is that but i think that slakin is a better like late game wielder that you recruit when you already have the capability to make dragons. Because you recruit him and you get two Eth draw and you're gonna automatically be able to upgrade them. I think it's the, the way to go for him. To Chira, the Dragon's Blood gives you one Ethra and two and seven shamans, but you also get Arcana and then Arcana Specialization. Another caster here with heavy offense. 
um, focus. Again, I, I still think Masugna is the best caster just because of that defense and, and huge capability for spell damage power. But uh, to try it here, nonetheless, is going to be focusing primarily on Arcana. So just to recap, again, I think Masugna is the best caster and uh, Arlok is probably the best starting wielder for Rana. Moving into spells, we get some spells that I honestly really struggled to like at first. So we're looking with Destruction, Creation, and Arcana, Arcana as our primary essences from all of our troops. And like I said, I, I really didn't like this at first because this is a terror. I don't really like Earth Block. You just move around it. It's a barrier. You really need specific maps to roll for you when you get into an engagement for this to be really good. And Psychic Spear only is going to be good if you can buff the damage to it or you've got advanced Arcana skills to target things multiple times. And Aggression is great, but if you take a look here at Troops, you don't get much destruction. You get here on your Storm Guard, you get here on your Riders of the Swamp. If you got some Adult Crawlers, you've got it, and if you get a Tremor, you've got it. But that's it. That's the rest of your destruction. Your main list is going to be focusing, prim focusing primarily on creation with that like secondary focus onto Arcana, Tertiary into destruction. So with that being said, I like so many skills here, these two especially, that it, I, it took me time to get the units in to make the spells work for me for Rana. Um, I think Repel is nice to shoot things backwards so that you can get some more breathing room to then shoot them again more. Um, I love Acid Cloud because you just drop a nice 20 damage cloud on top of things that then will blow up after two rounds. Of course, Fireball is always great. But one of the best combined spells that I really like here, well, also Arcane Storm is amazing. 40 damage and it just does a ton of damage to everything around it. So it is a really, really nice high Arcana damage ability. But this ability, Breath of the Phoenix, is amazing. De deals 64 damage in a horizontal line of three hexagons. It's really cool to get this bad boy to go off and just do a ton of damage. I I've used it so many times in this playthrough. Also, Entangle can be kind of nice because you can straight up shut down the movement of a troop, which is pretty advantageous. Uh, but other things like... Um, that's order and creation. Uh, explosive fungi, it can be all right. It's it's nice in the very beginning of the match to kind of create a situation where the, your, the AI will walk into a mine or if you have a choke point, you can use that. It is pretty nice. Um, but by and large, I think that this playthrough or, or Rana focuses a lot on these kind of top tier damage capabilities more so over than I think any other faction and looking at that means that you have to try to focus it in one direction either through skill specializations or skills or specializations or specific units and having the Chelan being able to just pump up your arcana and your creation is huge you'll get access to arcane storm so often whenever you play with the Chelan on your team Moving into skills, I want to talk about some of the stuff that I think really, really you can take advantage of with the uh, Rana. And archery is definitely one of them. Even though you get don't get a ton of variety of archers like Arleon, right? You get like three different types of range units. You still can use a lot of stacks of shamans and sages to get a lot of benefit out of this and increase that range. I do personally really like that. Of course, make sure you're focusing on command. You're going to be using it a lot. And also... I don't recommend these skills very often, but if you don't have enough Celestial Ore, you're going to struggle. You want to get your um, Hunters up to Storm Guards as fast as possible, and it requires five Celestial Ore. So you need to get this going, and I, maybe it doesn't need to be on your first hero, but try to bank five Celestial Ore, and if you cannot get a hold of it on your map, you're going to want this skill, trust me. Creation is going to be huge for you too, because like we said, that's going to be one of the big ones you'll be using. Same thing with Arcana um, and Destruction as well. Those are all really great. But I also really just think Melee is such a great um, skill here for just really increasing that Melee offense. Uh, you can go with something like Cunning, but I do find that my battles with Rana last very long. So I would lose the benefit of the three turns on this. So I, I don't find this as huge as, say, Baria, who can just blitz through those first three turns and, and either lose or die, whatever it is. Positioning is going to help you out with some range resistance if you're struggling, but I think that enough of the Rana units do get benefits against range, or at least they're fast enough that the AI won't even focus them. Like they will say maybe your Storm Guard, that they will focus, which you can buff with your defense. So... I think that the rage resistance here is cool, but I don't think it's as crucial. 
Um, where is that other one that I was looking for? It's not melee. It is combat training. Combat training is also very nice because I like the increase in retaliations as well as the damage increase, especially if you're baiting people into you. If your storm guard have two attacks or two retaliations on them, it just makes them a little bit scarier on the battlefield. Um, it's something that I really do like. But those are some things that I think will help you out in choosing which skills to go for. Again, you have the rest of your skills um, for your uh, for your economy. And actually, I find Tutor to be pretty good here. Because I like having a lot of wielders with Rana. So getting Tutor on my main one was enabled me to just take the rest of them and buff them up immediately. I, I, I think... In other playthroughs, I've slept on Tutor too much, and it has ended up kind of costing me having low impact wielders, whereas I can get a new wielder and immediately jump that wielder up to at least a quarter or 50% of my max level, and that's really nice. I think that's a really, really nice boon, and I think that it should definitely be one you try to get on your first or second wielder. Now, for powers, you get stuff like Attuned, which is really going to help you out with your uh, casting. Brutal helps out with that damage. Da uh, that damage. Rigor is really good though here because Rana is very tanky and this makes it even tankier. And I really do like that. Speed of the Winds is also very much going to help out your entire army, which is already quite slow. This gives them quite literally some wings. I don't like Eager because it only lasts for a round. I'm not, I'm not down with that. I want that full on permanent movement increase. And I think this one really helps out here. <clears throat> Uh, and I, I think that you'll just get a lot of advantage of it, especially that 20 initiative on, say, the Chelen, who go from 7 to 27 initiative. It's a very, very nice little touch for Rana. As far as building priority goes, though, we're going to jump here to Tier 1, and let's talk about that. So looking at our buildings, we look at the Lean 2 and the Shaman Tent as our two primary production points for our early units, right? And here's something that's kind of interesting. They require a lot of wood and a lot of stone. So I would take a look at my surrounding area before I even built anything and see, okay, I've got some stone right here. I've got some wood right here. I'd go and grab that and then decide which one to make, which one is going to, is going to create the better situation for me. Also, I'd look at what I started with. If I started with a bunch of range units, I'm going to want to lean to. If I started with a bunch of melee units, I'm going to want a shaman tent. So this depends upon your wielder. I'd say more so than most factions. So choose the one that's going to make sense for you. And then I would definitely make, um, who was it though? Okay, I would make a gatherer because you will have a ton of requirement of wood in this faction. So I'd go gatherer as my second small building slot for tier one. Moving into tier two, we get our medium build slot. So this is where you get to decide between mud huts, beast coral, corral, or chelin sanctuary. The beast corral is my personal choice. I like the beast corral the most depending upon the playthrough I have in mind for casting. If I'm not doing a caster, then Beast Corral it is. If I'm not really, really focusing a ton on casting, then I'll do the Chelan Sanctuary. What I like about the Chelan Sanctuary, though, is it's very easy to get online. It just requires a Shaman Tent, which you probably already have, and then it requires a Fungus Farm, which you might not already have. So I find it to be really easy to get going because it only takes five stone, three Ancient Amber, two Celestial Ore to upgrade it. And the first one here is just five stone, five ancient amber. So I'm really always stuck between the Beast Corral and the Chelan Sanctuary as far as what I really want to do. I save the Mud Huts for last. But the Beast Corral, again, it's a steeper cost, right? It's got double the stone. You got five Glimmer Weave versus ancient amber. And then you have to research the ability to make tremors. And then you have to make the tier two. So it can be kind of a big jump here. It's, it is easier to upgrade though. It only takes five Glimmer Weave versus the other one taking a bunch more other uh, resources. But uh, go with what fits your play style and the, in the, mo in the notion you have in mind for your build. Uh, Challenge Sanctuary for casting. Everything else I like is Beast Corral. Then from there, I would make the small building that you do not have for the corresponding medium building that you've built. Example, I have a lean-to, so I don't need to make a lean-to. But if I'm a Chelan Sanctuary, I need a Shaman Hunt, Shaman Tent before I even make it. So I would make a Shaman Tent. And then the second thing is a Fungus Farm. So that would honestly be all three buildings that I wanted to go Chelan Sanctuary right now. So that would be my focus there. Otherwise, I would probably go with something like a, um, a Gather or maybe another small uh, Lean to or Shaman Tent if I wanted to really bolster my amount of Hunters or bolster my amount of Shamans, depending on what I'm really focusing on. Uh, 
if I went here with this beast corral, I would probably just uh, drop a fungus farm or a, or a lean to, just to kind of give you an idea of how I'd approach that if I didn't go Chellen Sanctuary. And here we are at our tier three where we get the large build slot. So with this build site, you can go with the Ethra, but I just don't think it's a really good call at this point. I think the Dragon Pyramid is the way to go so that you can get access to your, um, well, eventually your Smoldering Cave that gives you access to the Elder Dragons. That's my personal opinion because I like the Elder Dragons. Um, like I said, it's steep cost though. Look at that. It's really steep cost. It's a really, 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 really steep cost. So keep it in mind before you go, you know, balls deep on that route. But Dragon Pyramid is, is the route for Elder Dragons. If you don't want Elder Dragons, go with the Birthing Pools to increase the size of your units. Get all the advantages that you can from having large unit sizes in Rana because you're really going to benefit from it. In addition to that, though, you do get one other medium build slot. I would make, um, at this point, either the Challenge Sanctuary or the Beast Corral that I didn't make in the previous tier. Uh, if you really want to focus on getting these guards out, then go with the mud huts. I just really wouldn't focus on the, the crawler upgrade. It's not as huge in my opinion. Yeah, these guys are good, but in my playthrough, they were the last things that I that I ended up upgrading because I just didn't find as huge of a use for them. Uh, I'm sorry, these guys are the last thing, thing that I never found a really a use for. I liked the guards enough, but I was getting them from so many ambient things around the map that I didn't find the need to really focus on this as much. So uh, again, I would use that medium slot for whatever I didn't build in the previous tier. Okay, so in tier four, we now have another medium build slot. And this would just be <clears throat> the only other thing that I didn't make of the other three. <laughs> I don't like to make an exchange here. I just do that in the small settlements. It's just not as huge of a focus for me. So in this situation, in my build right here, this is a beast corral. That's a mud hut. So this would have been, a, this would be a challenge sanctuary. But for these small buildings, I would then make any requirements for these upgrades that I don't have just to kind of reinforce that. But barring that, I would make one, if not two, lookout towers at this point. If I'm really suffering with wood like I was in this playthrough, I would have probably made actually another gatherer because you'll need wood to upgrade to that fifth tier. It's a 60 wood cost. It is very steep. So make sure you are ready to pay that wood troll toll to get up to that fifth tier. Let's actually jump to the fifth tier. So here we are, the fifth tier, it's here. And this is when I would make the Smoldering Cave. If you remember that you also also need to make the Chellen Sanctuary and then the Dragon Pyramid like I did not do at this point and I had to refund my birthing pools to make the Chellen, or uh, to make the, the Dragon Pyramid. So just be mindful of those things like I've said, but this is when I would make my Smoldering Cave. And then my other small build site would be a second lookout tower if I didn't make one, another fungus farm, whatever kind of fits what you need the most. Again, I really like having two lookout towers because if I do, here, I'll make it right now. Well, it's not going to reflect it. If I do, these increase, right? The, this is what it says. Defense, 10 max garrison size hunters, 7 max garrison size shamans, 2 hunters per round, 2 shamans per round. If I have two of these buildings out here, then that doubles that. And I'll get two ballistae for having two buildings up. So that's a really nice benefit there. In addition, I could just draft some troops to fill up uh, some of the stuff outside of that, like maybe adding in some Riders of the Swamp, whatever it is, so that I've got a really strong defensive capability at my home camp that I don't need to constantly be going back to to defend if something goes wrong. Making sure you have troops, troops here really makes so you can go out, range far, get some good some goodies so you don't have to worry about the AI or another player just completely taking your town without any resistance whatsoever. But that is how you approach tier five and the buildings for Rana. And at that, it brings our video here to a close. So hopefully you get a good understanding now of how Rana really operates. And like I've said, it's a very difficult faction because you have to rely so much on a lot of the synergies of the units around you. And that really makes choosing which units to put out pretty difficult. It's not as clear cut as just going, okay, this one's um, a, a really strong melee combatant. I'm putting it, this one out. I mean, bringing out the guards allows me to buff up my casters in the back lane. Then having my double stack of sage, they buff each other. All right. Well, I also need this guy to debuff them. Like so you, you have to kind of think all these things way more 
th or you have to think all these things through way more than the other factions, which I think are a little bit more straightforward. And Rana has a lot of complexities locked into it that once you crack open, you're really going to have a lot of fun with. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. If you have any questions, by all means, just go ahead and let me know in the comment section below. More than happy to help out. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Have a good one and take care.